The first hundred years of Perth's history was colourful, to say the least. At times there were shades of the Wild West. At others there were demonstrations of innovation and creativity. The cast of characters included heroes and scoundrels, along with men of vision who had the determination and grit to mould the town into something special. Just as Perth began in 1816 as a result of the War of 1812, our story resumes in 1916, with the Great War still raging in Europe. Many of Perth's sons were in the midst of it. Tragically, 43 of them would not return. For a while, it was thought that there were 45 souls lost, but in the midst of all the horror and darkness, there was a miracle. Lieutenant Scott from Perth was one of the first men to join up with the first contingent in, in 1914 with the start of World War I. And uh, Scott went overseas, as did a lot of Lanark, era, Lanark area boys, and um, many of them saw action in the Second Battle of Ypres in 1915, in April of 1915. And they fought some horrific battles over there. And Scott was lost at one point. He was presumed to be dead um, after, after that horrific battle uh, with the gas and everything going. Um, word had come back to Perth that he was dead. His father was minister of St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, and they were going to have a memorial for him, as well as William Wright, another soldier, uh, from Perth who was listed as being dead as well. So both these people were, you know, Perth is going to have a memorial. Hundreds of people crammed in this Presbyterian church in Perth. Um, but word had come from England through Scott's family that he had actually been found. He was actually alive. And the story goes is that People thought he was dead. The Germans had thought he was dead, actually, he was so badly wounded, and he was tossed in the pile of, with dead bodies. Uh, but supposedly, a German coming by with his dog, uh, the dog noticed, you know, picked out the body that you know Scott was still alive. And uh, at that point, the German doctors operated on him, and uh, he ended up becoming a prisoner of war, but was uh, returned to Canada in a prisoner of war exchange. Uh, so he did come back to Canada before the war was over. The whole town had gathered to um, have this memorial for him and Wright, but it was discovered that, yes, you know, Scott's actually alive. And it was discovered shortly thereafter that Wright was actually alive too. He had been wounded, but, you know, somehow his name was put on the, the list of those that were dead. But So happy ending. At least they know people uh, cared for them back home, and uh, everybody's happy that these two gentlemen did survive the war. Major wars tend to have an impact on technology, which in turn affects society. One example of this was the vast improvements in the automobile. You know, you look back and, and when the automobile first hit North America and uh, it changed everything. It, it changed where people went, obviously. It changed who they met. It changed who they married. It changed, it literally changed life as it was known, much as the computer has done in our own age, uh, the automobile did. Another significant change was the role of women in the workplace. The vast majority of jobs in the factories were held by women during the war. This would become a challenge for many of the men in finding work after the war. In 1922, an enterprising family by the name of Catrochi set up a new business in Perth. The, rail, the railroad we're putting the new line through to Toronto and the Italians working on the railroad in Perth and they used to come home to Belleville and they said to my father, why don't you come to Perth and open a store so we can get more fresh fruit and vegetables. So apparently he took the word, he came down to Perth, investigated and saw Charlie Foy. He was a lawyer, he had just bought that building on Gore Street and uh, he had the space. One half of the house was still vacant. He says, okay, I'll make a store there for you. And going through the 1922 Courier, 
I found the information, I found the ad that when he opened, it was, I think, October 26th, and in the ad it says, uh, new fruit store opening with fruits and vegetables, candy, and olive oil in big print. Now, olive oil in those days, only people knew it was Italians or maybe Greeks. They'd get a prescription at the drugstore for an ounce or two of olive oil. Yes, olive oil came in, in three-liter tins, not in small bottles. We had the kitchen back of the store. My mother always, you know, could use the kitchen cooking, and uh, she'd have to walk into the store to help serve a customer, and she'd be cooking something, and people would come in and say, hmm, that ever smell good. What are you cooking? Oh, I'm just doing some of this vegetables and olive oil. They would lift their nose with olive oil because they were used to using butter and lard. So now today you got you into the grocery store, you can find a, a three-foot section of olive oil in different bottles on the shelf. Sure. So that's how t times have changed over the years. In 1926 or 27, my father brought in the first carload of bananas into Perth. When he started peddling, he'd go out to the country stores and leave a bunch of bananas with them and a knife and tell them, you don't have to pay for it now, but when I come back next week, you can pay for me, pay for them if, the, if you sold them. Then in our store, we always had a bunch of bananas hanging in the doorway and two or three hanging in the store. And then in the summer months, we'd stand out in front and we'd have bananas out, of, out front. And a lot of the kids used to get fun running by, stealing a banana, <laughs> go up the street. Then when we had ripe bananas, we had them on sale and people coming out of the theater at night would stop by and buy a bag of bananas to take home. All small towns have their fair share of colorful characters at one time or another. One of the, the first uh, mechanics, uh, and, and I use that term uh, somewhat loosely, to work out on Highway 7 here in Perth, uh, operated in a little shed where uh, the Minuteman Cafe was for, for many, many years. And uh, he would fix cars. And, uh, but the thing that made him famous was he had a bear tied up at the back of his garage. He had a pet bear. And uh, he would feed the bear, and he kept it out there behind the shed. And uh, the story goes, and uh, I've heard it enough to believe that there's some element of truth in it, was that every now and then he would untie the bear, and they'd wrestle. Now, the problem was this particular gentleman was at a disadvantage because he had lost an arm in a sawmill accident somewhere south of north of Lanark, and uh, so the bear usually would win, but that was okay. Uh, he'd tie him back up, but, uh, and life would go on. But on one particular occasion, the bear knocked the mechanic out and wandered into town. And all of a sudden there was this great alarm. There was a bear wandering around in downtown Perth, you see. And the local constabulary or whatever uh, didn't know quite what to do with it. And unfortunately those days there was no humane society and they say the poor bear never made it back to the garage uh, where he lived. Now, as I say, uh, there were some colorful characters uh, fixing uh, cars in the old days, and, and that's just one. As the 20s progressed, the use of the automobile continued to spread at a furious pace. A family uh, that was um, heavily involved in the automobile business as the years went on were uh, two brothers, George and Lawrence James. And uh, they owned the local hardware store here in Perth uh, on the corner of Gore and Foster Street. And it was one of those uh, central places in Perth where everybody went. Uh, and with the advent of the automobile on the scene, George James decided, as did his brother Lawrence, that uh, selling cars would be a good idea. And so they became the local authorized Ford dealer. 
and they sold Ford automobiles out of their uh, hardware store. And I mean literally out of the hardware store because every spring when the new Model T's came out, they would take the large glass uh, showroom window out of their Foster Street wall, they would put planks down and they would have a few of their lads push the latest Model T up the ramp and through the window and into the back of the hardware. And there it would stay for the next few months so that anybody coming in could see the latest uh, Ford car. And in fact, uh, they did so well with the Fords that uh, they decided they'd like to sell new Chev cars as well. But they were told, of course, uh, that you couldn't be an authorized Ford dealer and an authorized dealer for General Motors at the same time, that that was just not possible. So George James walked down a block and bought the stone building uh, a block away, which now houses the pool room here in uh, Perth, and he turned it into Perth Motor Sales, and they sold new Chev cars. And uh, so for years in Perth, if you bought a new Chev or you bought a new Ford, you bought it from George James. It didn't matter which uh, 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 brand you, you chose. As the number of automobiles grew, so too did the demand for improved roads. Streets would have been mud uh, in those days. Most of them would have been wagon trails, really. And in fact, uh, the first automobiles in Canada were built so that the width of the wheels fit the uh, ruts of the wagons uh, so that uh, you could navigate the, uh, the wagon trails. When I was a small boy, I was six years old then, and I can go back that far because I remember uh, the, the town of Perth, what it's like. In fact, I, I live in Harvey Street, and there, there are no paved roads. There's a ditch that you had to go down and out, back of the car, out on the road. And I remember when I went there and uh, put in this, uh, road, the streets and the asphalt streets and the sidewalks and so on like that. I remember some of the workmen who were working on the, on the roadway, by the name Joe Bennett and Frank Cole, two of them I remember. Perth fared much better than most communities when the Great Depression hit. This in part was thanks to John Stewart, who had brought Wampole Pharmaceuticals and the Andrew Jurgens Company to town. The former Wind Shoe Company, by now the Perth Shoe Company, also played a major role. And by this time, of course, it was the 30s. And uh, times were tough. People weren't buying new footwear. But uh, John's successor, Bert Ainsley, would do something that would keep the company going through the lean years and would really save the company in the long run. He signed a deal with Dr. Locke. Now, Dr. Locke uh, was an orthopedic uh, doctor in Williamstown, Ontario, a small town uh, east of Perth. And uh, basically, Dr. Locke worked on people's feet. And uh, for a dollar, you would line up, and, and, uh, and uh, for a dollar, the good doctor would work for a minute on your feet, and away you would go. And uh, literally thousands and thousands of people came to Williamstown to have their feet worked on uh, by Dr. Locke. And uh, so he decided that part of what he would recommend for people was a specific style and type of shoe, and the, really the first, uh, you know, orthopedic shoes. And so he was recommending these, and he needed somebody to make them. Well, Bert Ainsley hustled down to Williamstown, and in 1932 signed a contract with the good doctor to have the Dr. Locke shoes produced in Perth. And so for the next number of years uh, in Perth, they would produce uh, they were the uh, exclusive manufacturer of the Dr. Locke orthopedic shoes, and, and that kept the company going through the 30s and, and the early 40s. Many Perthites have fond memories of hot summer days spent in the outdoor swimming pool. In the early 30s, we got a swimming pool in the a natural in the, in the river, and the, swim, the swimming pool house was built, and that's where we learned to swim. The Little Tay comes around and meanders through Stewart Park. Mm -hmm. So the outdoor pool was on, on the Big Tay as it come, came down over Haggard Dam. And so it was deep. And I think, I think still, if it's not being too controlled, right there off the cement, it's over your head. So, and I mean, I'm tall. 
It's over your head. So, and it's fast moving. So they had the little children's ones in the cement part that runs under. So it was protected. You couldn't get, sort of flow out into the river in case you got a little carried away. So it was always very active. It was, uh, it was, it was the spot to meet up in the summertime. Yeah. Tombstone, Arizona had the infamous gunfight at the OK Corral. Not to be outdone, Perth had the incident at the Square Deal Garage. Another uh, story, and again, the family told me, uh, the Bell family, they owned a garage out on Highway 7. But their dad, who built the garage, um, uh, once Highway 7 was completed and open, uh, all of a sudden there was a new route for trucks to get from Peterborough to Ottawa. And uh, so it became a very popular trucking route. And uh, Fred Bell, who, who had a garage out on Highway 7, realized that some of these trucks were coming through the dead of night and needed gasoline. And so he set up a little cot out in his garage so that he would be available there to pump gas uh, late in the evening, some right, sometimes right through the night. But as it turned out, Mr. Bell was also the local sheriff. And so as such, he, he carried a gun. Uh, as part of his equipment. Now, when he slept on the cot in the garage, he would hang the holster and the gun on the wall up above his bed. Well, one evening, a couple of lads decided that the garage would be a good place for a break and enter. And so they, they, they broke into the garage only to be surprised uh, to dis and discover that there was somebody in there. And they took one look at uh, Mr. Bell, who was just waking up, and they said, uh, old man, he said, uh, we, want every, you know, uh, we want everything of any value and all of your money. And Mr. Bell reached over, pulled the gun out of his holster, and said, if you can get by me and my six little friends here, you can have it. And uh, little did they know that they were under arrest. <laughs> So, uh, again, it's just one of those things that happens, eh? Yeah. As it is now, hockey was a huge part of life in Perth in the 1930s. The 1937-38 season would prove to be a memorable one. And that 1937-38 season was probably the best the Perth Juniors ever had. In fact, this is a season where they no longer are known as the Perth Juniors, but they become the Perth Blue Wings. And that happened in January of 1938. The team had already been playing uh, a few games just in the Van Horn series down in Kingston, which they easily won that series uh, and impressed a lot of the um, junior teams down in that area. And now just before their own local league was to begin, a league which comp was composed that year of Carlton Place, Renfrew and Pembroke, their arch rivals from previously, um, they were told by the Ottawa District Hockey Association that they were no longer allowed to have uniforms with a sponsor logo on it. They had been sponsored by Wampoles, which was a major pharmaceutical company in Perth here, and so they had a big crest on their chest with the, you know, big W saying Wampole Pharmaceuticals on there. So they had to remove that, and uh, it was decided by the players, that, well, according to Les Douglas, who was the captain of the team, he had, the players got together and decided to call themselves the Blue Wings. I think partly because he had uh, had a tryout that season with Red Wings, so it might have been a little bit of inkling that way. So that name stuck, and they picked up a logo that's similar to what the Detroit Red Wings have. And in that January of 1938, that was the first time that the Perth Blue Wings actually took the ice, as prior to that, they had been the Perth Juniors. A quiet and unassuming man who would become a prominent citizen and a major employer in town moved his business and family to Perth in 1938. My name is Heather Perkins McVeigh. I was born in Perth. I lived in Perth until I was about seven. And uh, I am Joe and Doris Perkins' oldest granddaughter. One of, the, one of his traits is he was a, a real people person. He was a businessman and he was a shrewd businessman. But if somebody needed something, he was often there to help out. Whether it was a couple of hundred dollars whether it was taking in a piece of machinery or even sometimes a piece of land in exchange for a vehicle, he did that too. Now I'm sure he always looked at the bottom line, but he was also there to help people out. And after he passed away, 
we began to really understand the depth of that. Most of the time it wasn't something he shared with us, it wasn't something he boasted about, he wasn't, uh, it didn't do it for notoriety. But at the funeral we had hundreds of people come up and comment about how my grandfather, I called him Bampy, how he had helped people or um, given them a couple of hundred dollars as a loan when they needed it and no one else would give them any money or had taken in uh, something unusual on a trade um, to help them get their start. A couple of people in town talked about how he bankrolled some of their businesses and that they paid him back over time, um, but that my grandfather never pressured him. So there was a lot of quiet ways he went about building the town of Perth. He was a very loyal person and he had a number of employees that worked there from when they were teenagers until uh, well past their retirement. And that to me says a lot about somebody. When you have that many loyal employees, they were almost like part of the family. My grandfather was not just a businessman in Perth. Perth meant something. His community meant a lot to him. And he did a lot to try to uh, grow the town of Perth and bring in various businesses. And beyond that, he also worked to support the infrastructure of Perth. For example, if the fire department needed a, a new vehicle, he'd be the first one to arrange for that. He may have only made about $500 on the sale, and then he'd go ahead and throw a party for the firefighters or the, for the town to celebrate the new vehicle, and that probably cost him $1,000. So made nothing on the deal at all, but did a lot to help grow pride in the town of Perth. He was never the mayor of Perth, but I always thought of him as like the unofficial mayor of Perth. When he drove down the street, the number of people that would wave at him, it was, all, it was always a bit of a family joke, because he'd wave back. A mere 21 years after the end of the so-called war to end all wars, the horror erupted again, and once again the young men of Perth stepped up. A particularly heroic soldier spent a good deal of his youth in Perth. Alex Campbell was not a native Perthite, but he was born in Halifax in uh, 1910. His, his father had been a veteran of the Boer War, and unfortunately, Harry Campbell uh, was killed around the Battle of Passchendaele in 1917. We're not really sure why the family ended up in Perth. One story has it that, you know, the family had left Quebec City looking for something different, and um, Sarah Campbell, the mother, got off the train in Perth and said, oh, this looks like a nice place to be, and they settled in Perth. Young Alex uh, settled right in as well, and uh, within a couple years, I think it was in 1921 or 1922, uh, in the winter months, he's walking along the Tay River uh, when he hears a young girl yelling help, and a young girl had fallen into the ice of the Tay River. And uh, a bunch of other young boys were standing around, but Alex was the one, being around 11 years old, 12 years old at the time, he was the only one who went out on the ice, pulled the girl out, and then another player, or sorry, I said another player, another boy, and I said player because he used his hockey stick, he reached out with his hockey stick to give to Alex Campbell and help pull Alex, who had the girl in, in his arms, pull her out of the water. Uh, and for that recognition, or for that uh, saving of the young girl, the Boy Scouts of Canada, because Alex was also a member of the Boy Scouts at the time, he was given a special silver medal for rescuing the girl. I think it was kind of a, a precursor of things to come with Alex because I would consider Alex Campbell to be a hero. He had a tough go of it, I guess, in, during the Depression, as many young men did as well. Uh, he did some painting around town and stuff like that. But his, but his real calling is probably, probably the military. Uh, throughout high school, he'd been part of the Perth Collegiate Institute Cadets. And um, after high school, he belonged to the Lanark Renfrew Militia, uh, rising to the rank of major at one point. And in April of 1940, he did go down to Picton and joined up with the um, uh, uh, regular force at that point. And uh, he was the company commander 
Uh, and, with, and one of his uh, lieutenants was a young Farley Mowat. And uh, they became quite good friends, starting in um, England, I guess, and uh, then a little bit more throughout Sicily and into Italy as well. Mowat talks about Campbell being a, you know, a very tough guy, but, you know, a very fair person as well. You know, nice guy, but just don't make him mad, basically. Uh, with the attack on Sicily and on July 10th, 1943, uh, the men went on onto the beaches and uh, the Italians had put up too much of an effort, too much of a resistance for the Canadians. Despite there not being a big resistance, uh, Campbell was still wounded, but it didn't uh, deter him from fighting at all. Lots of the men thought, well, geez, we've lost our commander now, but he stood there um, and still with the blood gushing out of his arm, still bellowed commands for everybody. Uh, and that definitely provided confidence for his men. And uh, eventually he did report to get his arm um, mended a little bit, but uh, he refused to be shipped off to the hospital, which again, I think demonstrated his overall uh, spirit with regards to fighting and his loyalty to his men as well. The hasty peace came upon, uh, a couple truckloads of Germans one morning and uh, Campbell didn't waste any time. His arm was still injured um, and he was carrying a Bren machine gun, which probably weighs around 20 pounds or something like that in one arm. And he went running down the hill, uh, firing at these two trucks, which shocked a lot of the men in his own, uh, own company as well and probably shocked the Germans somewhat at the same time. But he just fired into the back of the trucks and as the Germans were piling out, he probably ended up killing about 20 Germans at that point. Uh, and this, I think, motivated and also frightened his own men at the same time, seeing what this guy could do, because he seemed like a very nice guy most often, but uh, he was a soldier, had a hatred of the Germans perhaps because of uh, what had happened to his father, and this was a second war with them. And Campbell continued on into Italy as well with his, with his regiment, uh, he and Moat became quite good friends. And throughout the time, Campbell had written a poem. He had started writing a little poem, which is called Prayer Before Battle, while he was in North Africa. It was just a small thing, but it uh, became much large, large. It became a full poem. And what the poem was really about was his own fear of being a soldier and the fact that he's been chosen to lead these men, but he himself is fearful and he can't show his men his fear. You know, and this really is something I think a lot of soldiers deal with, just that overall fear when they're out there. I mean, I, I think every soldier when they're out there has some type of fear. Every man, every woman would have fear in a situation like that. So, but he can't show that because all of his men look, look up to him. And I think that makes it especially difficult for him. And that's what his poem is about, is that overall fear. Uh, but despite being wounded once in the arm and another wound in the cheek at another time, the only thing that manages to get him out of the, the fighting is when he comes down with jaundice and he ends up spending a couple months in hospital in North Africa as a result of that. And finally, December of 1943, he makes his way back and he's being promoted from captain to major uh, with the hasty peas. And um, it's on Christmas morning, just the day after he's returned but back to the front, uh, the hasty peas are kind of trapped by a machine gun. He got up and he wanted to get rid of that uh, machine gun nest and he just went running across um, no man's land there, firing at the machine gun, uh, only to be machine gunned down himself. And uh, some people thought, you know, crazy, but hey, what a, what a soldier basically. Uh, and Farley Mowat many years later wrote to Campbell's sister saying that, that Mowat and the fellow his fellow soldiers were the true murderers of Alex Campbell. The reason why Moat felt that he was the one of the murderers of Alex Campbell is that they put so much pressure on Campbell. Uh, they, they saw him as a great leader. They felt he had to do, he felt he had to do heroic things to win their trust and to keep them motivated. And that probably the only thing he could do at that point to keep them motivated was to make that rush, even though uh, it was almost suicide for him. Although there were some other soldiers that did say he was within 100 meters of winning the Victoria Cross. Joe Perkins bought the Taggart Services Trucking Company in 1944. My grandmother, Doris Taggart, 
Her uncle Fred um, had founded Taggart Service and he'd had a heart attack and uh, felt that he just wasn't physically able to continue running the business. So um, he offered it to my grandfather and my grandfather took that over and subsequently moved the headquarters from Ottawa to Perth. And uh, that was a business that of course uh, he developed over many years and was really the mainstay of the many businesses that he had as well as the car dealership. He became very involved in the Ontario Trucking Association, was on their um, board of directors for many years, and so he met people all across the province, and uh, I know that he gained a lot from that. In 1947, Jesse Mabel Stewart donated an extensive downtown property to the town of Perth as a memorial to her husband John Stewart. It was given with the condition that it be used as a place of relaxation and enjoyment, but not for competitive games or sport, or for any commercial enterprises for profit. She also included an endowment fund to cover the costs of maintenance. Perennial Gardens, which is uh, still a fairly new asset to um, Stewart Park, um, it hasn't been here, I believe, a little over five years, and it just keeps filling out and filling out and it's a gorgeous place to be if you can come and see it. Um, August is a time to be here. It seems that most of the flowers are in bloom mm. and it's it's gorgeous. It's so pretty. Every color you could think of is here. Heritage? They're a very heritage type of bridge and they're, and they're curved. There's one down here and there's one further up and it's much higher. My kids and I call it the love bridge because it looks like it should be a love scene in a movie on top of this beautiful bridge. I've seen picnics with 50 to 100 people to start. I've seen birthday parties. There are a pile of weddings that come through here and um, I actually got to see one last week and it was pretty nice to see. They were located here actually right at the perennial gardens and it was beautiful. Just the backdrop to the color of the flowers and you know, her in her dress and that beautiful picturesque day and it was it was perfect for them it was just as it is today um, we have the Stewart Park Festival which uh, this year we the town did themselves and it was just we had more than we've ever had before um, come and uh, join us for that so that was pretty exciting when we got back some numbers the distinctive Perkins Motors building would be built soon after the war and officially opened in 1948 the historic building was, was torn down for this new state-of-the-art architecture building with the curved sides and the curved windows. And he was really proud of that building. And it was a, a feat of architecture for its day. OPP headquarters was on the second floor for a period of time until I think Taggart Service took over a part. And then later on, my grandfather built um, another office out on um, the highway on Highway 7 on Dufferin Street and um, that's where most of the Taggart service, the terminal and the offices were. Little Jimmy Duncan and I, uh, I helped him with his news newspaper route in the day, the Ottawa Journal. And the drop-off point was the Perkins gas bar. So inside that old gas bar at the front in the rounded part uh, was an old Coke machine. And so when we'd finish the paper route, we'd get a Coke and we'd sit there and, you know, the old bottle openers. So that's, and I mean, you'd stick your head in the garage. Those were the days where kids could run around and do anything, you know. And you'd see Mr. Ramsey in there working on his cars and, oh, it was fun. And it made greasy, grimy, and you'd be sitting on the floor. And that, that's, yeah, that's my memories of Perkins Building. Fun place. Oh, and of course, the bowling alley up top. We yeah. bowled. I would set up pins in the bowling alley on weekends and holidays. Al Kalerik ran the bowling alley. He was the manager as well as being a salesman um, of the GM dealership. And he would have to teach you to be a, a pin girl or a pin boy because it was, at the time that I recall, it was manual. And you had to jump out of the way. And you were, you were like um, uh, in the back, in the background, and when somebody you know, got a strike, then you would set them all back up again and huddle and, you know, scamper along the back behind everybody. Uh, certainly uh, bowling was something we would do on a weekend. There wasn't that much else to do in Perth. 
The 1950s proved to be an unprecedented era of prosperity. A notable example of this in Perth was a deal signed between Perth Shoes and the American-based Brown Shoe Company that would ensure significant employment for many years to come. In 1953, Eric Sabiston signed a deal with the Brown Shoe Company of St. Louis, Missouri to become the exclusive Canadian manufacturer of their products, which was uh, the Brown Shoe, Naturalizers, Buster Brown's Children's Wear, and so on. And at the time, that was hailed as a, as a great deal because it provided a small Canadian company in Perth with a large research and development team, American-based, but nonetheless a large research and development team uh, who had access to marketing and uh, promotional uh, things that a small company in Perth could never touch. And so, um, again, when uh, the company, uh, the Pershoe company, uh, became the exclusive manufacturer of the um, naturalizer shoes, uh, and Buster Brown's children's wear, again, it, it meant more and more or orders, and, and that was a good thing. Then in 1959, Eric Sabison did, again, something that no one expected him to do. He sold his majority rights in the Purse Shoe Company to the Brown Shoe Company of St. Louis. And as uh, the late 50s, are the, uh, there was much concern in Canada about the American takeover of Canadian companies, about the substantial investment of American capital in Canadian companies, and uh, the Pershoe Company was one of them. Uh, on the streets of Perth at the time, if you talked to people, there would be people who would tell you that if Eric hadn't have sold the, the company to the large American company, it, it would never have lasted. But there are others who said, who would say, no, uh, you know, it should have been kept Canadians. It should never have been sold out uh, to, to an American firm. It was simply a, a financial uh, transaction, uh, you know, um, that should not have happened. But uh, to carry the story on, once the American company, the Brown Shoe Company, took over ownership of the Perth Shoe Company, they changed the name. It became the Perth Shoe Company of Canada. So it was run as a subsidiary of the American company here in Perth, but it was no longer the Perth Shoe Company. Uh, they decided that the old factory on Sherbrooke Street was uh, no longer suitable, so they built a new factory on Sunset Boulevard, and that became uh, the new uh, shoe factory, the Brown Shoe Company of Canada. They kept their offices and their warehouse in the old brick building, until the mid-60s when they built new warehousing and offices on Rogers Road here in, uh, in Perth. At the height of the operation in the 60s and 70s, uh, the Brown Shoe Company of Canada, located or headquartered here in Perth, also ran a factory in Alexandria, Ontario, and a factory in Stirling, Ontario. So at its height, there were three factories all producing shoes and uh, footwear for the uh, Canadian market. The growth of the automobile continued to accelerate after the war, and Perkins Motors was very much a part of it. And a number of people commented that instead of saying, oh, I'm going to go to, to buy a car, I'm going to go see Joe. It was a, a very endearing way of saying that he was the man. And although my grandfather had a number of salespeople by that time, um, many people only wanted to deal one-to-one -one with him. And my uncle Harry was very involved in the car dealership and was sort of my grandfather's right-hand man at the car dealership and for all intents and purposes was involved in the day-to-day -day operations. And my uncle um, was involved in the, my uncle Bill was involved in the, the trucking end of things. More vehicles on the road meant more gas needed. And over the next few decades, Perth would have no shortage of gas stations. When you come in Wilson Street, uh, on the right-hand side, there was uh, Bob Cameron there. Uh, he was on the right. And then across the street, there was a, I think it was a city service. Uh, that's where the movie gallery is now. And uh, was there one there where uh, the gas bar is? What gas bar? Where the Mr. Gas is. Yeah, there was one there too. So that's three coming in Wilson Street. And uh, then as you... Uh, 
turn left there and come down and turn on the main drag. If you get down to, to here, there was uh, one across the bridge here on the right-hand side. It was a Texaco. And uh, when you went a little further to the next stop sign where you turn left to go to Smith Falls, there was a service station on the right-hand side. And across the street, uh, as you go out towards Smith Falls on the right, there was another service station. And then when you go further in Gore Street and head towards the, the uh, Scotts Line, there was a, I think there was a city service on the left-hand side. And then when you get out there, there was Donaldson's and uh, a city service out there. But I can't remember where it was. And then as you go down the Smith Falls Highway, when you pop over the hill where the jail is, when you get to the bottom of that hill, there was one on the right. And then when you got just to the outskirts where 3M Can uh, Canada is, there was one right on that corner on the right-hand side. So that took in a lot of service stations. Like, I thought about it the other day there, and I thought, my goodness, how did the town ever support that many service stations? In 1965, the Legion moved from its original home in the Matheson House to its brand new building on Beckwith Street. The building would later house the magnificent Hall of Remembrance. The Legion started about 1946. It started up at the, in the Matheson House where the museum is on Gongore Street. The Legion bought it about 1946-47. And then 1965, they built this place here. They raised the money themselves, and they, they had a lot of workers, because they had all the World War, World War II sweats were still around here. Those days, we didn't have associate members or things like that. That came later on. It is quite large. The capacity in the auditorium is 254. I know when I, when my current wife and I got married in uh, 1988, we had uh, 250, 250 invited and 243 showed. So I, I know what can be done. And we had a sword party and all. Uh, upstairs we had the Hall of Remembrance. That yes. was started by a chap by the name of Bill Buffin was the first creator. And Jack Churchill, Del Harper, Bill Riddle, and Barry Mulville. They were the ones who built everything up there, Del Harper particularly. And we have artifacts of over 10,000. We have a, a wonderful library, and uh, we have a lot of artifacts and things have been don donated. We have a full-time creator who's John Gemmel, who's first vice president right now. He's also deputy mayor of the town, and he's very in interested in history. Terry O'Hearn, ex-Navy. He's a public relations officer. He's also a third vice right now. And uh, he, in fact, he's the webmaster for Zone G6 on the Legion. We have a wonderful website, and it's always available there. Dave Bell would begin a long and illustrious career in the Perth Fire Department in 1965. There had been massive changes in firefighting since the early decades of the century, and in the 39-year span of his career, Dave would see and instigate many more. When I first came on to the, on the department back in 1965, the means of alerting the firefighters was by a siren mounted on top of the town hall, which could be heard all over the town. So you had to respond to the town hall where the fire hall was and the caretaker of the town hall at that time lived in a small apartment in the town hall and he would write the address of the fire on the blackboard outside the fire hall. So if the vehicles were gone when you arrived there, you knew at least knew where to go. And as time moved on, they put a fire phone system in which consisted of a red phone in the dispatch center of town hall where the police were located at that time. And as soon as you picked that phone up, it was connected to the phones of all the driver operators and the officers of the department. Their phones would immediately start to ring steady. They did not ring like a normal phone. It was just a constant ringing until the phone was picked up. You never talked, you just listened. And if you were having a conversation with somebody else, you were cut off immediately and you heard the report of the fire and where it was. And then we went to the pagers, which allowed the firefighters then to go outside of their homes. Uh, didn't have to be right beside the phone because there were no cell phones in those days. 
And so it allowed them to move around even the whole municipality with their wearing their pager. And then now we're into cell phones and two-way radios. So the alert happens very quickly now. Yeah, fire department, right off the bat, you think fire. And maybe that's why the names of some of them now, they're, they're search and rescue. Uh, and yes, the fire departments do many, if there's any kind of an emergency, and if there's a use or a possible need, the fire department will be there. Ice rescue. Because we have, most of us have rivers through our municipalities. So you train for that. Search and rescue. Somebody gets lost. Yes, you... We take training to do that, and they'll go out and assist with that. Floods, sandbagging. Firefighters are good at sandbagging. Yes, Perth has had some major fires. Fortunately, we have uh, been able to maintain or retain most of the, uh, I'm going to call it the facades of the original downtown business area, with the exception of the block where the Toronto Dominion Bank is now situated. There was a fire there. The building was three stories high, which was completely destroyed. Can't remember the exact year at this time. And once again, that's where this mutual aid system that I spoke about came into action. Almont was here. Smith Falls was here. BBD&E were here. Lanark Village was here. Carlton Place was here. They all came to help. And we had another major fire at the former Perth Library. The facade of the building was saved. But the contents gone, and the library built a new facility to be in, and private business purchased the old library and uh, restored it to other uses, but maintained that outside look. Kelly's Flowers uh, was a major fire just shortly before I retired, and unfortunately that was a fire that resulted in a fatality. Uh, those things do happen. Uh, unfortunately, we can't save everybody. We, we try, but it just doesn't always work. Uh. Dave's career would experience a particularly momentous event on a cold winter day in January 1983. There was another serious fire January the 4th, 1983. I was still a volunteer at that time, and uh, my place of business was on Highway 7. The apartment building where the fire occurred was on Mather Avenue, just in past the beer store. And I received the call, and I was heading to the fire station because I was a driver operator at that time to get a truck. And I debated going in Wilson Street, whether go to the hall, go to the scene, and at the last minute as I crossed the tracks, I made the decision to turn and go and check it out. And when I arrived, the father was on the front lawn of the building, bleeding profusely, having come through a window. And he was just screaming that his wife and baby were in the apartment. I immediately said, I have to go in and look for them. And there were some bypasses around. One in particular was Robert Dixon, a taxi company operator, and he said, you can't go in there, and I said, I have to. And I went into the building, lowered myself in gently. Uh, I could hear the mother gasping for breath. I didn't realize when I went in, I actually stepped on the baby. But as I say, I lowered myself in gingerly. And so I found the mother, and when I got her back to where the window was, that's when I discovered the baby, passed the baby out, Robert Dixon had fashioned a life rope, for the lack of a better description, out of the belts of all the men that happened to be around outside, so that I had some way to find my way back to the window. Fortunately, I was able to get both the baby and the mother out, and they spent considerable time in hospital, but both recovered. Uh, following that, the province saw fit to present me with the Ontario Firefighters Medal for Bravery, and the Government of Canada presented me with the Star of Courage at Government House in Ottawa. If there was ever a person who personified the expression don't mistake kindness for weakness, it was Joe Perkins. This quiet, friendly, and generous man 
stood his ground against no less than the infamous Teamsters Union when they struck against Taggart Services in 1966. The strike um, is something that certainly had a huge impact on him and on our whole family. That, of course, was in 1966. And the violence occurred in the Montreal, out of the Montreal terminal. One of the drivers, uh, Joe Watts, was grazed in the neck by a bullet. And but for the fact that he was leaning over to take something out of the ashtray, he would likely not have survived and likely have been killed. In addition to that, there were Molotov cocktails um, hurled over the fence at the terminal in Montreal and off of the um, bridges. So the Teamsters are a serious bunch, as my grandfather reminded us. And in fact, I recall that we had police officers in the backyard in the town of Perth because of the concern that the violence would spread. And it was certainly something that I was aware of, even though I wasn't living in Perth at the time. Because as my grandfather said, you don't play with the Teamsters and uh, you take this seriously. And while I was at school out of uh, Perth, um, my mother reminded me to be very careful to look both ways, not speak to strangers, those important pieces of advice. So although my grandfather was um, certainly never a fan of the Teamsters Union, uh, he always treated his employees with all the respect he could, and I know that he was aware of how fragile those kind of relationships can be. The Teamsters were very powerful in the 60s. It was I don't remember the year that Jimmy Hoffa died, but certainly it was that era of muscle. But he also made it clear that he wasn't going to let the, the Teamsters um, beat him down, and he stood his ground. The dawning of the 70s saw the arrival of adult and post-secondary education in Perth when the new Algonquin College Perth campus was established. It would evolve considerably over the next four and a half decades. So the Perth campus uh, was established actually uh, as the Adult Education Centre. That's what it first was in 1967. Uh, and it became part of Algonquin College in uh, late 1970. And in its early days, um, starting in 67 and in through the 70s, more trades-based, vocational training-based. Um, they had machining uh, programs here, uh, so metalwork programs. Um, today, of course, we have um, three specialty trades programs. We have a construction carpentry advanced housing program where they actually build a house in their second uh, year of that program. And then two heritage programs. Uh, one heritage program is in carpentry. Uh, carpentry and joinery, and the other heritage program is in masonry. And they do the traditional uh, brick and stone mason, stone mason, as well as uh, heritage. Um, so we do dry stone walling. Um, they'll work on uh, stone cutting and stone carving, like you would see on Parliament Hill. So they'll actually learn those techniques as well. The Perth campus, um, including our uh, community employment services, so that's a service that's over uh, on the other side of Perth, all together, part-time, full-time. Uh, it's about 55 to 60 staff, and that includes, of course, teachers, um, administ administrative support staff, uh, as well as uh, management staff. So it's, it's a fair number, uh, and we have... Uh, um, a number of services that they provide to our students, which number about 300. So we have about 300 students go here. It, it's interesting where our students do come from. Uh, I would say a good, a good portion of our students come from Lanark County. Um, but a little less than half come from, from outside the county. So you start getting into Ottawa and, and Kingston and other parts of eastern Ontario. And then you're getting into southern Ontario. Um, and then you're getting into a cross country. So we have students from uh, out west, you know, BC, Alberta, and out east, uh, international. This past year, we had a student from Ireland. We had a student from uh, South Korea. We had a student from France. Uh, we had a student from uh, China. And so you do get uh, some international students. We certainly would like to see more of that because I mean, I think we feel we've got lots to share here. Um, but they do, they come from all over and, uh, and from the states as well. We notice that the graduates for our heritage uh, programs, uh, they're going across country, actually across North America. Um, 
the Parliament buildings uh, is probably the most uh, um, famous example of that. It's it's a five billion dollar project. Over uh, it's going to take us through till the year 2030 to do all that work. Our campus is a community asset. That's the way we look at it. And we're not just in the community, but we're part of it. So we do a lot of work with with community partners here in Perth. Um, we've done different structures with the town. Um, either some repairs, um, there's a historic home here in town called the Injiva House and our students have worked on that property and we currently have a memorandum of understanding with the Ontario Heritage Trust to do some additional work uh, over the years coming in the carpentry and masonry area. So we have um, four community studies programs, so a social service worker program. These are individuals that work in various organizations and agencies helping individuals. Um, we also deliver early childhood education uh, program. It's a diploma uh, program. Um, we have a police foundations program that's delivered over two years. And then there's our personal support worker program, uh, which is a program that uh, is in that nursing stream, the healthcare stream. So working in a long-term care facility, um, maybe working with someone in their home to provide them support they need so they can stay in their home. The other area that we have is business and hospitality, and then we have office administration. Uh, two streams, one is called general, the other one's executive, certificate versus diploma program. So a whole set of skills on what it is to work in an office setting, um, desktop publishing, uh, computer applications, accounting, uh, communication skills, everything you need to be a success and sort of give you a good foundation. I had the opportunity to be the governor on the Algonquin College Board of Governors. So I did that for six years. And uh, I had also the opportunity to lead the fundraising for the new campus that we have here in Perth. I'm a strong, strong supporter of that also, of Algonquin College. I think it really speaks highly of a community when you can have post-secondary school. And the programs that they offer there are, are pretty unique and pretty special. And the students have a... Uh, you talk to past students and... They can't speak highly enough of their experience with the faculty and just, you know, the opportunities that they had here. It's just a fun place to be. And, uh, you know, once once people come and get a chance to, to take a look at the campus firsthand, they're hooked, uh, just like I was. At the three-quarters mark of the 20th century, the Perth Courier began its fifth generation of ownership. I'm John Clement. I'm the former owner-publisher of the Perth Courier newspaper here in Perth. Um, I was the publisher from 1975 through to 2006 when I uh, sold the newspaper to Metroland. And uh, prior to 1975, um, the newspaper was in the family. I was the fifth generation. From about uh, the 1862 and prior to that, there was uh, an uncle of one of the original owners that uh, was in the newspaper since the late 1840s. I started when I was 14 years old in, in the business, um, sweeping the floors and carrying the, the uh, cleaning up the lead and that sort of thing. But I also graduated, if that's what you call it, to actually feeding the big press. We had a press that was hand fed, that uh, printed four pages at a time, and the sheets that went through were 36 inches by 48 inches, three by four feet, and you hand fed those through. You climbed up onto this platform to feed them, and there'd be about 500 pages at a time that, that you fed through before you redid it. We had about uh, 14 people that were directly involved with the newspaper, including front end people who uh, dealt with the customers. Um, we normally had three reporters that covered everything in the town, uh, which they don't do now, unfortunately, but that's the situation. And uh, then the people at the back who did all the production work, um, everything from camera work to setting type to um, actually operating the presses and that sort of thing. It was an eye-opener with the job that I had as a reporter at the Perth Courier. I got to see how everything kind of worked together with government and the agencies and all the different community groups, um, how everything worked together to make the town what it is and how people work to make it a, a vibrant community and really come together to, to find things for people of all ages to be involved in. And The last 
paper that we did with hot lead was in 1978. We started uh, change over in about 1976, 75, um, going to more film, uh, less hot lead. Going hot lead uh, in those days, I'm not so sure that you could you would even be able to do that today without safety people really coming in and, and making a, a scene of how you operated because as I mentioned earlier, we had a lead pot that um, was at 500 over 500 degrees Fahrenheit. There were fumes off that and what we used to do is uh, uh, recycle the, the uh, type uh, which would have a solvent on it to, to clean the ink off, or if there'd be some ink on it, there'd be dirt involved, and you'd be sweeping the floor with uh, to get some of the lead back into the, this, and you pour it back into this uh, molten mess. And we, although we had a, a fan that drew the fumes off, there was this, there were still fumes there, and then we'd clean out that so it was clean lead because there'd be this film of of guck on the top. And there's a black powder called a flux that you poured into it and you stirred it around in there to get all the dirt up to the top and then you'd scrape it off and um, you'd get splattered with, with lead, you know, your arms would, would have burns on it from the lead and I'm sure that in those old days that uh, um, people used to say that people in the newspaper business were, were bit alcoholics, they could have been. But I'm sure a lot of them even had lead poisoning to some extent because they were dealing, they were handling lead all the time. And um, so whether that's true or not, that's just one of my theories. I'm very proud of the Perth Courier, uh, what we did with it. It was uh, uh, certainly an institution in this, in this community. Um, it grew with the community, it reported on the community. And um, being part of five generations uh, was even better for me and uh, for my family and uh, um, I was proud to be part of it and part of this this whole community because as I mentioned earlier I had a very good staff which allowed me to get out into the community and do other things. John Stewart, no relation to his namesake from the early days of the century, came to Perth in 1980. He had been hired by Heritage Canada to spearhead the Main Street program in Perth the program itself is a really good, it's a good concept. It's a, the idea of revitalization, but incorporating heritage as part of the, of the, the community's strategy, a strategy that involved um, um, some, some economic redevelopment, uh, a lot of, a lot of um, marketing, a lot of promotion, and a lot of organization. And at the time, the BIA had just formed in Perth, and so that was the organizational component of it and the marketing component we got involved with sidewalk sales and all the things but we also got involved with the idea of taking some of these buildings back and giving them a uh, a new presentation i guess and one of the first projects we worked on was girdwood's drugstore and so we worked out uh, signage and we worked out a color scheme and this is a very handsome stone building so it just needed kind of some dressing up and we had this gold lettering girdwood and the black background it was I mean it was very quite a quite a nice looking package and we'd wave these illustrations around and everybody was excited about it so I came back to town two days later and somehow or another they got the paint mixed up and instead of being this rich rich um, burgundy it was just Pepto-Bismol pink Everybody in town, I mean, there's an article in the paper and everybody's upset and these guys are trying to do something to it. Anyway, so that was funny. And I uh, sort of sat back and I thought, you know, if this program is going to work, one of the key things is to actually have somebody in the community and working with the community. And so we packed up and we moved from Ottawa and we moved to Perth, which was a big step for us because, you know, we had kids in school and we settled and it was it was a big move and uh, it took a bit of talking and a bit of convincing and so here we are now and the strategy put emphasis on marketing it put emphasis on redevelopment um, economic redevelopment the idea of taking an old building like this and converting it to um, bringing it along so that it wasn't sitting derelict 
the idea of, of a marketing strategy, um, a promotion, and getting out there and selling yourself, and, and the idea of just good design. So it meant good window design, good facade design, um, understanding how a building worked, and all of the all the ingredients, but pushing all of these buttons instead of just never talking really about heritage, heritage, heritage. And that came on. I mean, now it's heritage Perth and everything is heritage this and heritage that. It's, it's kind of overworked word at the moment. Standalone, smaller hospitals were facing major challenges, and the best way to combat those challenges was to join forces with other hospitals. Early on, I think the, the medical community, and we all recognized that uh, we had two hospitals 20 kilometers apart, and essentially that um, together we would be stronger as one, one hospital with two campuses than separate identities. So there was a lot of discussion, and uh, I wasn't involved in it at that point in time. It was just, just before I became uh, placed on council. But a lot of wise people sat around the table and said, between the two campuses, between the two sites, what services are going to go where? Uh, and uh, so it was looked at, it was discussed, there were uh, many sleepless nights for a lot of people, uh, and I think there were um, probably some very uh, intensive debates, uh, but in the end it's worked out very well because we're a stronger hospital with it. That happened back in, in the 90s, in the mid-90s. Um, um, there were a number of healthcare leaders uh, in Perth, both the Perth community and the Smith Falls community who knew that that's what had to happen uh, in order for us to keep hospital services in our community. Um, they had their tires slashed, uh, they had threats uh, made against them, they were accused of being traitors and betraying their community. Um, they had a very difficult time. Um, but their wisdom has served us well and uh, we have a very healthy Christmas Falls Hospital at this point. Um, we've gone, at the time of amalgamation, there was 205 acute care beds between three facilities. Um, we immediately went to just over 100. We cut that back to 95, and two years ago, we cut it back to 85. And the reality is that with 85 acute care beds, we have more people using hospital services than we had 20 years ago. We have, and, and we've got services we wouldn't have had otherwise. I mean, we've got a uh, dialysis service. We wouldn't have had as three separate hospitals. Um, we've got a CAT scan, which we wouldn't have as three separate hospitals. We've got two orthopedic surgeons. We've got a maternity department. We've got uh, urology specialists. Uh, we've got specialist uh, surgeons uh, in the community. And, and again, separately, we would not have had those things. By the late 80s, all the homes in the basin area had been demolished. There was considerable controversy for the next several years about what should become of the area. In my day, the basin, there was a street there and houses there. So I can remember one of the houses was the Ramseys and then there were two or three others sort of working up towards that corner where the post office used to be and the old library used to be. The other, like that was an actual street. <laughs> And, and, you know, you walked along the street and the basin was there, but I mean, we fished off the basin all the time. You know, boats were in it. There was a Murray Walker's Haida. It was a little replica of a warship, an actual warship. And I mean, when I say little, I don't mean little. It was probably the size of this room of an actual ship called the Haida. And he, he, it was in the basin all the time. Other than the residences, there were a lot of, of sort of purpose-built uh, sheds and shanties down there that uh, um, had seen better days and, and that uh, it wasn't hard to justify uh, removing them in, in, with the idea that something bigger might or better might, might happen. And so uh, back in the uh, 60s, uh, one of the local businessmen uh, told, uh, suggested that the town of Perth should begin to buy that property because it was very valuable. And so the uh, town council began to buy up lots in that area and uh, with the intent that eventually there would be a development of some sort there. I mean we had a lot of things happening downtown and I thought we could justify a, a downtown grocery store. Well it doesn't fit the typical model of what grocery stores in those times were wanting to, to build or develop. Uh, uh, you're seeing some of those more appropriate uh, investments in grocery store infrastructure being made in the city now, but certainly 
25, 30 years ago, that wasn't the case. And, and um, so we had a parking challenge uh, as far as, as the number of parking places per square foot, um, uh, that sort of thing that, that happened. And we had some loading and unloading challenges, getting trucks into the downtown area and accommodating them. Jack Diamond, I mean, who's an internationally famous architect now, was, was in Perth and, and was part of uh, the development of, of the plans for that area. We had to make a decision as a council because there was a proposal for a grocery store in that land. And that was, like you, I jumped in with two feet, you know, because you're making what was really a major decision. And it only passed by one vote. It was that close not to have the grocery store. They took in more proposals and more debate and more years went by and somebody says somebody's feeding cows down there on the hay that's growing in the in the uh, property by the river. You know the the Rideau Center and there's the uh, uh, walkway between the um, the Hudson Bay Company and the center. So I'm, I'm on this walkway and I'm heading off to a meeting and I stop and I look out and here are these huge machines and they're coming along, big clamping jaws, and they're coming along and they're just chewing up this glass. And like it's, it, it was sort of almost obscene watching these crushing things. And so I got on the phone and I called City Hall, Ottawa City Hall, and I said to them, uh, what would it take to get sections of the bus mall? I, would they be available? And the guy said to me, uh, do we pay you or are you gonna pay us? <laughs> <laughs> ah, perfect. This is too... so. Then I organized, and for the price of having the the um, movers put these on flatbeds and bring them to town, and you know, I sort of had an idea of what we would do with them. And basically, they're they're uh, like the building would be here, and they were on an angle, so they kind of this um, veranda on each side of the street. So I bought enough of it and I brought them together like that and then built this monitor between them. So running down the center and gave it the, the, the width that needed, but also, and uh, now it's the farmer's market. And it's a, it's a nice little product. It's a, the, sort of something else to, to come to. It provides a focus and it's a lovely part of the, uh, the, the downtown. Uh, the history of what happened on the basin property was a, a long, long story, and I wasn't part of <laughs> most of it, but I was there when the pieces of the former bus shelter on Rideau Street came to Perth. And it was a big event for our newsroom. All three of us, uh, my husband Ian, who wasn't my husband at the time, and our editor Maureen Pegg and I, we got up at three in the morning to see the uh, the, the big moving trucks bring all of the, the glass pieces into town and uh, and leave them at the Basin property. And so the shift then moved to a theater and uh, that we perhaps could become the Stratford of Eastern Ontario. And, uh, and so there was a lot of effort put into uh, a theater that had some uh, retail component to it. Um, and that's where the Crystal Palace came from. Uh, the Crystal Palace was was viewed as being the, the seed building that would allow the rest of this development to take place. And again, the long range plan was the Crystal Palace would be worked into a, a vestibule or a waiting area or a meeting area uh, adjacent to, to, the, uh, to the theater. And, uh, but again, I think the realities of where we were and the, the, and the economics of a theater um, just weren't there. I know there were some who were for it and some who were opposed, but ultimately I think it's become a fabulous public space and really quite a, a jewel for the downtown because it's uh, the farmer's market's there, there's lots of events there, um, the, with the, the basin there and the opportunity for people to access the, the Rideau Canal through the Tay Canal. Yes, and they, they decorate the Christmas trees in there and they have fireworks from the bridge at Christmas to sort of kick off the, the Christmas season. And no, it, it worked out really well, but it was that close to being a grocery store. It's just an interesting 
space. And I, I like the fact that if you walk around the Crystal Palace, you can still see some of the signs that were there for part of the, uh, the bus shelter. Mm -hmm. And I remember standing at that bus shelter <laughs> under the bay sign <laughs> when I was a student, and there it is now in downtown Perth. So I don't think there probably was an, an issue confronting the town council in the town of Perth that occupied more time, more arguing, over the years than they did the development of the uh, downtown core. Everybody had an idea of what should be there. A new voice was heard in Perth for the first time as Lake 88.1 FM hit the airwaves. We launched on October the 10th of 2007, and uh, so we're coming up to our eighth anniversary. Well, this is the main control room of uh, Lake 88, and in here we've got uh, an audio board that uh, has got many uh, different inputs for microphones, etc. We have uh, space for our main announcer. We also do our news from in this particular studio, and we've got lots of room for guests that come in as well. So uh, sometimes we can have uh, two, three, four, even five or six people in here. Plus we've done some live uh, singing, fiddle players, guitarists, a little bit of everything in here. Uh, we've gone from uh, you know a smaller staff to about almost eight full-time staff and another ten part-time. Um, we have news people that we're very proud of that uh, are on the air doing a full news service in the morning, midday, right up until six o'clock at night. And with that, we have our reporters who are covering places such as Westport, Rideau Lakes region. Um, we've got uh, reporters in Smith Falls, in Perth Council, Lanark County. And we've also got reporters in Carleton Place, Elmont, etc. Um, so it's a it's a wide diversity. Wherever the signal is going, we're trying to uh, serve that particular community. But if you look at our our main contour of radio being a, a round uh, coverage signal as opposed to individual municipalities and, and borders, etc., we um, have a potential of about sixty thousand people that we can. Uh, we can reach. And we just want to welcome everybody to Perth. We've got a beautiful day for our Perth Hill run today. So we welcome you. If you're a first time person in the Perth, it's really great to have you with us today. We really appreciate you coming and visiting us during the world's famous Perth Hill run. Well, we like to think that we are, you know, part of the fabric of the community now. Um, it hasn't been that long. It's uh, seven and a half years that we've been going. But uh, we've certainly, with a number of people that are coming in using the services, not only for news content, everything from, uh, as we mentioned, funeral announcements to major news stories, etc., to lots of sports. Um, we do junior hockey talk. We look at six different uh, uh, junior hockey uh uh, junior A and Junior B hockey teams over the course of uh, the week, uh, mm. tucked away on Thursday nights at 6 o'clock. We do Ottawa Senators hockey. We're part of that affiliation as well, the network. Uh, a lot of people are Sens fans. And even if they're not, they still enjoy oh, sure. live hockey. But um, but all this uh, interaction, it's the content, the news, the talking. It's the community being part of the station, which, uh, which we, we really enjoy. People coming in and using it, everything from ham and bean suppers to major mm -hmm. you know, county or municipal um, stories like that. It's, yeah. it's nice to see people engaging in dialogue and coming and airing it. And, and it's uh, you know, part and parcel of what we're all about. And it's nice to see that the community is using the facility as well. Lots of different um, situations for people to come in and be part of it. Um, we do 15 to 25 interviews over the course of a week and uh, those can be small ones with our morning man Dave White in the morning or larger scale midday Angie Pacey, Bob Perot on news uh, with us in the afternoon and into the weekends too. So it's a lot of people traipsing into the building, a lot of people sitting behind the mics, some quite nervous when they first started, but boy, they get the message out and about three minutes into it, they're comfortable, they're talking to their friends, to their community, really using to its maximum potential the signal that we have in this neck of the woods. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily hear a ham and bean supper on a large uh, station in a large market, but to us, it's part and parcel of what we do, and a lot of people really appreciate the fact that even the smallest events, the smallest of causes, can get airtime with us. 
this is our second uh, production um, studio. And what this allows us to do is have uh, people come in, record their own commercials. We have a lot of local merchants who are um, advertisers with us, record their own commercials. They could become the voice of their business, which is great. And then we put music beds behind here. We put sound effects, etc. We don't get any federal funds as much as some people think we do. Uh, it's all advertiser driven. And the advertisers are getting the feedback just as we are for stories. They're getting it for the offers that they put out there. People buying and it keeps the whole wheel moving that way. All of the employees at Lake 88 work extremely hard, multitasking as we do to run a, a small station. As I said before, I really feel that we're using the full breadth and width of this particular signal to do a lot of different information programming, etc. So, what if you were to give a kilt run? And not only would thousands of people come, but it would also be copied in three other countries around the world. Well, how cool would that be? And who would think of a thing like that? Well, I mean, we could start with the uh, mayor of town of Perth, uh, Mr. John Fennick, uh, who put a challenge out to the town residents to see if they come up with an idea to, um, to, to really recognize the 800th anniversary of the founding of our sister town, Perth, Scotland. And um, I think some time had gone by, and I was just sitting in my office, actually, 2 o'clock in the afternoon in October 2009, and I just had an idea of, um, well, I sent an email to Mary, just a one-line thing. I said, Mary, what about an idea that uh, people run in kilts? And that was it. Um, <laughs> from there, <laughs> from there, in the next two weeks, uh, we got busy to look at and see if it was actually feasible. And um, I contacted some kilt suppliers to see if they could handle um, supplying us with as many as 100 kilts. I suggested that we could have that many if we actually promoted it properly. <laughs> so actually, I was reviewing an email from the other day and, and uh, from back in 2009, and that's exactly uh, where it went. And then after that, it was a matter of forming a committee and uh, getting the right people together to make it happen. Which It was at the end of 2009 that I went to the town council the first time. And uh, I, I stopped and I, I looked out the window across uh, Gore Street at Drum Street, and I said, imagine next year Look at Drummond Street, 100 people in kilts running down that. A, a sight you've never seen in the town of Perth before. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, don't know if that could happen or not. So we'd had the committee meeting and we'd set the registration and we were hoping to get 100 because we knew some friends and stuff. And the uh, registration, we had to put a cap on it because of the software system. So we were hitting, sitting in our hotel room then and we looked at the registration and it was stopped because it was over 500. And that happened just in that weekend that we had like 200 people sign up. Um, so it hit 500, so then we had to call the rest of the committee and say, what are we going to do now? Just, well, they, they said, well, uh, it's the 800th anniversary of Perth Scotland, move it up to 800. Uh, and so that was good until uh, the first two weeks of February, and it exceeded 800. And then we said, well, make it 1,000, because it's going to be the 200th anniversary of Perth, Ontario coming up in 2016, and 800 for Perth Scotland. And anyway, we ended up with, uh, well, and that first year, the race uh, finished with 1,074, which became the new Guinness record then. Uh, so we wrapped it all up. We went, every penny we had in the bank went to the MS Society in Ottawa. I think our first year's donations uh, exceeded $25,000, so it was uh, very successful. Yeah, it just seems to be uh, pulling people of all shapes, sizes, ages, <laughs> um, just, I guess, because of the fun of it. And, you know, I've had grandfathers come into the store here and say, oh, you know, they'll be 80 or 85 the first year we were having it, and say, oh, I want to run with my granddaughter. And have you run before? Well, in high school, you know, and so my heart is like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we like, had concerns the first year when we looked at like, the answers yes, list. You know, and, uh, uh, but we're probably one of the few races that had, in this year's race, Mary responsible for that. We had a defibrillator at every water station. <laughs> you just never know. <laughs> yeah, so our oldest uh, runner, we talked about this earlier, was uh, Eric Devlin of Perth. Um, from here originally, I think uh, the last time he ran, he was 93, and he's saving it up for, for next year's race, which will be a little bit older. But we've had younger ones, too, um, right, right down to pr probably f four or five that somehow made it through the race for the five-mile race. Um, now, we added kids' race a couple years ago, and that's been a tremendous hit. Uh, two and four year olds running and stuff. So of course our volunteers are really the, the core of, of the event right now. We have had over 180 volunteers this year. 
and they do everything from sorting kilts. Of course, we, when you register, you order a kilt. So every year, uh, we have seven or 800 kilts of all sizes. And of course, you may have ordered a t-shirt as well, so we have to match your t-shirt. The size of your t-shirt with the size of your kilt. <laughs> Stick a label on it and tie them together. 2016 is a complete revamp for the 20th anniversary. We want to make it special. So, and we also want to make it our third official Guinness record attempt. So our goal is 5,000. And to do that, we've redone the course so the Guinness record would be based on one mile. Uh, but the traditional race that we had every year is five miles. Mm -hmm. So the course now, the five milers and the one milers start at the same time. And the first mile is shared. We're calling that the Royal Mile. So you can enter just the one mile and that way there's no excuse everybody in Perth and everybody anywhere can run the one mile. Uh, but those who want to stay in the classic distance can enter the five mile, but still be, they'll still get basically a free entry into the one mile as well. So we'll count them when they go by and they'll be included in the one mile. And we've even a, 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 a added a half marathon distance, which includes the same first mile. But then Sunday, we're working already on the first kilted marathon in the world. But we already have like a dozen people signed up and we've just opened registration for next year for the, for the marathon. And it's a chance to qualify for Boston wearing a kilt and a kilt and marathon. Since these films have been looking backward at the story of Perth over the last 199 years, it seems only fitting to look forward and speculate what the future might bring. So we asked a few people for their thoughts about and hopes for the future of Perth. The buildings that we have now um, are our best assets and should remain exactly the way they are. While well, things change around them in technology, that if I walk down that street, it would bring back memories of uh, a walk that you and I took just 10 minutes ago. Perth will continue to be a tourist destination. I think it will continue to be a, a destination for, uh, for people looking to retire to a, to a slower pace than what they've lived in, in the large centers. And, um, and that's good, and I think we can, we can build on that. And I think there's an opportunity to not necessarily freeze Perth, but to keep that element for the next generation as well. That 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 story, that that uh, um, specialness, and the privilege to be come here and visit something a special place, or the privilege to live live in a special place, and that's really what we have. <laughs> Thank you.